our text for tonight. It's taken from the book of Isaiah, the 63rd chapter, the end of the 16th, the, the end of the 63rd chapter and the beginning of the 64th chapter. Doubtless you are our father, though Abraham was ignorant of us and Israel does not acknowledge us. You, O oh Lord, are our father. Our redeemer from everlasting is your name. O oh Lord, why have you made us stray from your ways and harden our hearts from your fear? Return for your servants' sake the tribes of your inheritance. Your holy people have possessed it but a little while. Our adversaries have trodden down your sanctuary. We have become like those of old over whom you never ruled, those who were never called by your name. Oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down, that the mountains might shake at your presence as the fire burns brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to our, to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things for which we did not look, you came down. The mountains shook at your presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen any God besides you who acts for the one who waits for him. You meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. You are indeed angry for we have sinned in these ways we continue and we need to be saved. But we are like an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself up to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are potter. And we and all we are the work of your hand. Here ends text for our sermon. <clears throat> This is a common theme that comes up many times in scripture. We are the children of Abraham. We are the children of Israel. And Jesus speaks on this even at Palm Sunday, doesn't he? I can raise up stones, children of Abraham, from these stones. If you think that's going to get you anything, think again. Abraham doesn't know you. Israel doesn't know you. They don't have any idea that you were born. My grandfather died just before Matt was born. He knew Matt was coming. He has no knowledge of the other two. And it's frustrating for me at funerals sometimes i preached a wonderful sermon and then somebody from the family stands up and says they're looking down on us now from heaven you really want your loved one to see what's going on down here to see when you do something wrong to see you short someone or do something disgusting when you sin that they should watch that and we rejoice that they're in heaven and they're away from all of these things that we go through here on earth. And so Isaiah is hitting them just as hard as Jesus does. If you think you're Abraham's children or the children of Israel, they don't even know who you are. That's not going to get you anywhere. Isaiah says some interesting words. He preaches a hard sermon to them. Their earthly fathers don't even know that they exist. And then it sounds like he's blaming God for their sins. Why have you made us stray from your ways and hardened our heart from your fear? We know that God doesn't make us sin. And in the next words, he really points out, he's being facetious here, obviously. He points out in the words that come after, what did God have to do to you people? 
before you would listen to him. Well, your ancestors heard him shake the mountains at Mount Sinai and shake the earth and him speak from heaven. He's already done that. To let fire from heaven boil water? Well, let me see. Uh, when he consumed the sacrifice, when the prophets of Baal weren't, were trying to get their God to wake up, and all the water that was poured on Elijah's sacrifice was consumed. He's alluding to a number of these things that God did for them. It's mighty signs. He just throws it all into one category and finally. No eye has seen, no ear has heard of any such God like you. But what did they do? They did not listen. We have sinned, and in these ways we continue. It's not just that they were sinners, but they were continuing in their sin. They were leading lives actively against him. Persistent and continual sin. And then we have a proof passage from our catechism in this text. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And I don't want to be too blunt this evening what he's saying there, but it's in the catechism in the area of are we doomed for sure? Yes. Because if you look at that word in the Hebrew language, it's about the stuff that gets flushed down in the toilet. Our best effort is toilet trash. Of course, they didn't have them in Isaiah's day, but you get the understanding. And so he does an incredible thing here. He goes back to God's faithfulness. And he's trying to get the people to realize we can't do this on our own. And he pleads to God some mercy. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. And it takes an act of God to give us life. Isaiah knows what's going to happen. The people are going to continue to rebel against him. More prophets are coming after him, Jeremiah being the probably the biggest or best known. And the Israelites are going to be taken away into captivity, and he refers to it in the text. He says, we've been in this land for such a small time. And your sanctuary has already once been sacked, it's going to be completely destroyed. So he asks God in your faithfulness to rend the benefits again. To come to them and save them because they can't save themselves. This is an incredible request. Since we are in trouble, we need you to come to us. Has anything ever changed since that time? Well, yeah, actually it did. Who came? Christ. The Son. And just like the Israelites asked at the time when God thundered at them from heaven, 
Speak through a servant. Don't speak directly to us. And God said, you know, you've actually asked for a smart thing because that's how I'm going to do it. And I'm not just talking about Moses. I'm talking about my son. Who is again going to come and do miraculous things among you. And reach out to you. And so Isaiah is asking for this. Asking for Jesus to come. And he says there is no other name, a real name for salvation. No God has done what you have done. And so Isaiah begs God to come again. We need you to form us new, to mold us as clay. And shape us and take us from what we were to what we will become. One of the most incredible things in Scripture is God's transformation of people. How he can take an enemy of his, Saul, and make him his greatest apostle and missionary. How he can take the runt of the litter, the seventh son who Father did it deem worthy to meet Samuel and turn him into Israel's greatest king on earth. See, it's not about us. It's all about what can God do with you. And so I've heard many times in Lutheran services, I'm not perfect yet, but God's not done with me yet. That's a really good Lutheran motto if you think about it. I'm not there with him yet. I'm not perfected yet. Because he's not done with me yet. And so we see here the whole purpose of Advent too, don't we? Not only did Jesus come, And show us how dearly God loved us. With his incarnation. Just think that God had to hang out in Mary's stomach for nine months. To be born in a barn. To be considered helpless. How God chose two incredible people to raise his son. Chose them very wisely from history. When the time had fully come, God sent his son. Born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under the law. But God comes in his word. They're so interconnected that John the Bap, John the Apostle says he is the word. He calls him the word. The Logos. Because it's a living and powerful word. He is what the Father wants us to hear from his mouth. The one who would come in between the Father yelling from heaven and the people that God tried to call to himself to fulfill the prophecy given by Moses that the people have asked for a good thing. And so remember, when we pray, thy kingdom come, if you look in your catechism, we're not just talking about the end where we get to go to be with God.
Luther's very different from a lot of how other people would answer that today. Because so many people just point to the God of salvation, the God of triumph. Even there's a TV evangelism program with that triumph name, isn't there? They're forgetting something. How do you get there in the first place? Because God's kingdom of grace needs to come to you first. Make you alive again. Form you like a potter. Breathe into you life. And connected to Christ, then comes the kingdom of glory. Not before, but after. And so what has God also done for us? He's connected us to this kingdom of grace. You have it. There was a story of a minister who was quite successful. His church kept growing and growing. And, he, and somebody came to him and asked him, what are you doing at your church? And he said, well, here's the situation. When I got here, I had about 45, 50 people. And I preached to them. And then they went and preached to the next group. And eventually those all started to come to church with them. And so now I'm preaching to 400 people who go out and preach the message. And that's how the church grows. Amazing how you have this. You have this. And it's a message of light to a sin darkened world message they so desperately need to hear because Jesus is coming again. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all our human understanding let that peace be with our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting.